Spanish to not save yet, but I'm going to talk about it, that's okay. Uh, right, should we start? Yes. We have one more minute. Right, probably some people will delay it. Uh, good, maybe I can just start with some general information that, uh, yeah. Uh, so, welcome to the second Sport City lecture. Uh, as you, so, some news about uh, what happens in the course. As you see, we are doing this, uh, this video recording of, 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 of our lectures. The first lecture is already there on YouTube. It was posted, I think, two days ago. Uh, so now we are recording the second one. We'll be posting it uh, there uh, every week so that you can see. There is a link to the to the to the recordings to the YouTube channel on the web page of the course. Uh, good. Uh, what else? The, you have the Cypress homework. I hope that all of you have already looked at it at some point. Uh, the deadline is in two weeks, I think. Next week we will be posting the second homework. I think that's the plan. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Okay. We can start the lectures. Okay. Uh, good. So last week, Martin was talking about various like motivating examples for 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 the structural sparsity that we are trying to develop. And uh, essentially, you are looking at various graph classes, in particular at, at, at the class of planar graphs, uh, which is like uh, the most important probably class of sparse graphs. Uh, you are also looking at some decompositional, uh, let's say, concepts like true of 3 depth and some basic notions of sparsity, in particular degeneracy, uh, maximum average degree, and arboricity. So just to recall, the, I think that the thing that you started with was, was this MAD parameter. So MAD stands for maximum average degree in your graph and this is just the maximum over all subsets over all subgraphs of my graph of the average degree in the subset and average degree is exactly the same as just the uh, twice the number of edges over the number of vertices due to the handshaking lemma so this is just twice the maximum over all subgraphs, yes, the number of edges divided by the number of vectors. So this I will often call the edge density of the graph, yes? So this is the basic uh, parameter that just gov gov governs the, the number of edges I can see in a, in a graph, and this is very closely uh, related to something called the degeneracy of a graph, so the degeneracy of G Oh, uh, maybe I'll write it the degeneracy of a graph G is just a, a maximum maximum integer k such that every subgraph has a vertex of degree at most k. Maybe there are some Large degree or high degree vertices in, in your graph, but if you take any subgraph, there will be a, small, a vertex of small degrees. Yes, you will not have a subgraph where all the degrees are large. So these two things, these two concepts were related to each other essentially. It's like mod, as far as I remember, mod of G is like this, the degeneracy of G, and this is bound by twice mod. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong here, but I think that this is like that. Yeah, so they are essentially factor two apart from each other, uh, which means that they are functionally for the for our theory building. Uh, it's the other way around. This is the other way around, of course. Like replace a mod with degeneracy in each word. Now it's okay. Um, by two, by the degeneracy as well. Okay. No, then put. Deck mod deck. Sorry? It's deck mod deck, not mod deck. Okay, we can. What? It, meaning? No, it was okay. It was okay. Okay, I'll write it like this. Like that? 
I hope, okay. They are factor two apart from each other, and it doesn't really matter for the theory. No. If one is bounded, the second one is bounded as well. Yes? No. No? It doesn't work. The, the last one worked, but it doesn't. Okay. So, let me. Math today. <laughs> yeah, we need to switch math and deck. Again. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> But you know that if, if I have one inequality like that, I have also the other one, yes? So the one is sandwiched between a function of the other. Yeah, let's think about it. Uh, if I am k degenerate, every subgraph has at most k times n edges, yes? And therefore the average degree in it is like k half. Uh, twice k. Yes? So this certifies this inequality. And this inequality is just certified by saying that if the, uh, the average degree in every subgraph is bounded by k, then for sure I have a vertex of degree at most k. Yes? Because I have a vertex of <laughs> degree not higher than the average. Good. OK, so these were the two notions that, uh, that we were looking at uh, last week. And now we are trying to build a, an abstract theory of structural sparsity uh, based on this intuition. And the first observation that, uh, that comes to my mind is the following. And sort of this observation is the base of, of, of what we'll be doing throughout the whole semester. So if G is a graph, and I look at the, let's say that G prime, is the one subdivision of G. So what is that? I just take G, maybe there's a super dense graph, say a click. And now I make a new graph G prime by just putting a vertex inside every edge. Yes, yeah, so in other words, I replace every every edge with a day, with a path onto vertex on, onto edges. Yes? Then I claim that G prime is always two degenerate. So why so? So if I take any subgraph of such a one subdivision, either I take any of those subdividing vertices, and then I'm happy because I see a vertex of degree two at most. Yes? Or I do not take any of them, but then I take only the original vertices, which after subdivision, yes, there are no edges between them. Yes, so I take an edgeless graph. So all the, all the degrees are zero. Yeah, so this was the proof of this observation. And now when we stare at this example, we need to ask ourselves, is such a graph, a one subdivision of a huge clique, sparse or dense? Because according to these definitions, it is sparse, right? And somehow you need to now make a, like a project decision for the theory building program that you are doing, yes? Do we consider this sparse or dense? If you consider this sparse, then you essentially end up with a theory based on these two notions, yes? Which is nice, which, is, uh, which gives you some nice uh, corollary both combinatorially and algorithmically. Um, but I would say it's not that terribly deep. So during this course, we will actually say that this graph for us will be dense. <laughs> and we will define in a moment why we think it is dense. And the intuition here is that even though you somehow obfuscated this large clique by subdividing vertices, you still see like a really complex structure, a clique, at sort of level one, right? At the depth one. So now we are going to try to formalize this, um, this, uh, this intuition. What does it mean to see some structure at some bounded depth, say depth 1 in such a case? So for this, um, we will use this minor order that, we will, that was um, also discussed last week. So just to recall, so I say that the graph H is a minor of G, yes, I will denote it like that, 
if there is a minor model of H in G. So what's a minor model? Essentially, it's like an embedding notion. So I've got one of my, my favorite graph H that I would like to embed. Let's say that it looks like that. So this is H. Here is my large host graph G. Yeah. And that my minor model, say phi, it looks like that, that each of those vertices is embedded to a connected subgraph here. So think of that, that I take this vertex and I smear it here on the connected subgraph of vertices. Yes. Here I've got a connected subgraph corresponding to this vertex, here to this vertex, and here to the last one. And the rule is that these connected subgraphs should be disjoint, yes? And moreover, whenever there is an edge here, there should be an edge between the corresponding subgraphs. These subgraphs will be often called branch sets for reasons uh, unknown to me, uh, but this is how they are called. Um, and this is kind of a topological embedding notion for graphs, yes? So the idea is that I'm not embedding single edges to single edges, but I'm sort of taking vertices and extending them to connected subgraphs. Good, so um, you can now think about, say, H minor free graph. So these are graphs that do not contain H as a minor. Yes, and they were sort of discussed uh, last week. Uh, for instance, uh, planar graphs are exactly graphs that do not contain K5 and K33 as a minor. Yes, this is the basic, uh, basic Kuratowski-Wagner theorem. Um, also, H minor free graphs are sparse in the following sense that if you exclude KT as a minor, um, then your edge density is at most t square root log t. Yes, this is a proof by Kostochka, and we had the last time a, a simple proof that fact that if G is uh, kt minor three, <coughs> then the edge density is at most two to the t. Yes, so these graphs are sparse. Um, so you can develop the whole theory of those H minor free graphs, and this is a deep theory because it turns out that um, the resemblance to planar graphs is not a coincidence. Every KT minor free graph has sort of a decomposition, which essentially tells you that it is you can glue it from parts of the graph that are um, that are embeddable in some in some in some fixed surface. So you can actually employ a lot of topological tools to study H minor free graphs, but this is not the fear that we will be going into. Because the idea is that H minor freeness is too much for us, in a sense. We would like to exclude complex structures at a local level, yes? While in definition of minors, these branches can be super large, yeah? So now the idea is to sort of define a notion of a local minor, or actually they are called shallow minors. Yeah? So the idea is very simple. I will say that H is a depth D minor of G if there is a minor model where branch sets are of radius at most d. So the idea is that now instead of saying that I have just connected subgraphs here, I will have subgraphs which will have bounded radius. 
each of them needs to have contain a vertex such that all the other vertices of this branch set are at the distance S of D. Is it clear? Yes? So this is the idea that somehow we are now thinking that this, this, this minor model needs to be local in a sense. So, so some examples. So let's say that infinity minors, what are they? Just minors. Just minors. What are depth zero minors? Subgraphs. Yes? Because now every vertex needs to be mapped to a subgraph of radius zero, which needs to be one vertex. Yeah? So this depth, bounded depth minors or shallow minors give you some sort of a trade-off between the minor order and the subgraph order. Yeah? So now this is the right notion for sort of locally embedding a structure, a dense structure. And now in order to develop a theory, we need to understand what does it mean a complex structure. Yeah? So in this case, a complex structure was a clique. And once you think about it, what does it mean for a theory of sparsity to be complex or dense? There are two natural ways to answer this question. One answer is that something is dense if its edge density is large. Right? This is natural. Second possible answer, something is dense or complicated if simply it is a clique. Yeah? So these two answers to this interpretation, to this question, give you two main notions that will be studied in this course, namely that of bounded expansion and nowhere density. Okay, I probably can erase this part. So first of all, let's look at the idea of bounding the edge density among the depth D minors. So I will say that if G is a graph, then I'll write like this. Grab D of G is maximum over all D shallow minors yes, of the edge density of H. So I look at all possible D shallow minors of my graph and I measure how large is edge density and take the maximum, the largest possible, the densest possible D shallow minor. So just a quick exercise for you. What is graph zero of a graph? Mod over two. Sorry? Mod over two. Mod over two. Yeah, because mod is exactly uh, like twice this ratio over all subgraphs. Yes, and subgraphs are exactly depth zero minus. Good. So this gives you this intuition that, uh, well, I would like to have uh, not too dense structures also at some bounded depth. Okay, so this is the first notion. So this is called GRUD, or, and this stands for greatest reduced, I think reduced, average degree. Yeah, so somebody named the greatest reduced average degree. This abbreviates to grad, and therefore we are now stuck with this great notation. Yeah, so um, I have some suspicion whose joke is it, but uh, let me not go into the details here. Um, so this is the answer when you ask about, uh, about uh, density of, of, of shallow minors. And now you can answer that a complicated structure is just a clique. And I will just say that omega at depth d is just the uh, largest, let me write it like this, maximum, maximum t such that kt is a depth d minor. So I look at all possible click minors that I can achieve at some depth d, and I look at what is the largest click minor that I can see at depth d. Yes? So these are two 
notions yes, that govern how complicated structures you can see at depth d. Yeah? So now given these two definitions, I can finally define what does it mean to have bounded expansion and what does it mean to have uh, to be nowhere than. So first, a class of A. Uh, um, well, this applies to a single graph, right? But I can also apply these operators to a class of graphs. So if C is a class of graphs, <coughs> then I can write that grad D of the class is just the supremum over all graphs, yes, of the graph. So this is the worst possible graph at depth D among the, the members of my class, and the same for omega. Yeah. Note that these can be infinite, right? For every particular graph, well, I cannot put more larger click minor than say it's vertex count, yes, inside, yes? On the other hand, if I look now at whole classes of graphs, yes, then there is a qualitative difference between having unbounded size clicks as depth D minors and having only a universal upper bound on the, on the sizes of clicks that I can get as depth D minors. And this, this, this difference is, is precisely the notion, the notion that we are now going to, to define. So I will say that the class C has bounded expansion if I will write it in a concise and a little bit hackery way for every D the grad at the D is fine. What does it mean? In, if I unpack this definition, uh, there exists a function f from natural numbers to natural numbers, such that for every graph in my class, yes, its graph at depth d is bounded by f of d. Yes, this function f of d is just the supremum. Yes? So this just means that, say, depth 0 minors have edge density bounded by 10. Depth 1 minors have edge density bounded by 100. Depth 2 mi minors have edge density bounded by 1000. And so on and so on. Yes? So there is always a constant upper bound on the edge density among depth d minors. This co but this constant <coughs> can grow with d. Yes? That's the main idea of this definition. And similarly, I will say that C is nowhere dense if same happens for omega. For every constant depth I will look at, the omega at depth D is finite. So in other words, there exists a function t from natural to natural, so that in every graph from my class, I cannot find larger click minors at depth d than t of d. Yes, there is a at depth zero. I can see only I don't know ten size uh, clicks of ten, size ten as depth zero minors. At depth one, I can see only clicks of size 100, and so on and so on. Again, the bound can grow with d, but at every constant depth, it is fixed. It is clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So this is just the formalization of this intuition that we had in the beginning, that we want to exclude some complex structure at every constant depth. Good. So, let's, uh, so these are the two definitions. So let's look at some examples and see that uh, this definition definitions indeed uh, encompass classes of, of sparse graphs that we have already looked at. So first of all, when you look at just graphs of constant maximum degree, so 
fact one or lemma one. Yeah, I claim that if C is a class with maximum degree at most delta, yeah, so every member of, of this class has maximum degree at most delta, then C has bounded expansion. Just to point out here that um, it's a little bit counterintuitive at the beginning, but, uh, but it is really, really, really um, useful to think about sparsity as not tailored to one particular graph, but tailored to a graph class. Yes? According to these definitions, we can say that a graph class consists of sparse graphs, because this is expressed in boundedness of some parameter over the whole graph class. When you ask a, a question, <laughs> is a clique of size 100 sparse or, or, or dense? Well, the answer is probably it depends what does it mean, sparse or dense. Yes? But you can say that sparsity is like a property of all the graphs in some large, uh, or in some infinite size uh, class of graphs. Yes? And this is how we are going to think about it. Okay, going back to this lemma, I claim that if I have a constant upper bound on the maximum degree in the graph for my class, then I have bounded expansion. And why so? So this is actually really simple. Um, I claim that if G is in my class, so this means that the maximum degree in G, well, is bounded by, by delta. Um, and H is a depth D minor of G then actually the maximum degree in H is also bounded just by, I think, uh, I wrote there delta power d plus 1. Yeah? So why so? So if H is a depth d minor of G, let's look at the picture. So this is G. Here I've got this, this, this minor model of H. Yes? So it consists of some branch sets. Maybe here is one branch set. Right? This, what do we know about this branch set? Well, it has radius d. Yeah? So I can here find the vertex such that every other vertex of this branch set is at, the, is at distance at most d from this one. Yeah? So let's zoom in. Maybe here is the center. Yeah? So this center has at most delta neighbors. Yes? Each of these neighbors has at most, again, delta other neighbors, and so on, and so on, and so on. So this whole, bra this whole thing, yes, has depth at most d, right? And now when I look at those leaves of this tree, yes, so I, I just take any BFS tree inside the branch set, yes? Then each of them can also create a connection to at most delta other branch sets, right? So I can, by just taking any BFS tree inside the branch set and appending those, those connections <coughs> to the other branch sets that neighbor this one, yes, I create a tree of depth at most d plus 1 whose leaves correspond to branch sets that can neighbor this one, yes? So this means that this branch set can possibly neighbor at most, well, a tree of depth d plus 1, uh, where each vertex has at most delta children, has at most delta power d plus 1 leaves. Yes? So this means that this branch set can possibly neighbor be adjacent to at most this number of other branches, so the maximum degree in my shallow minor is bounded like that. Yep. Good, so this means, this in particular implies that if the maximum degree in H is bounded, then also the, the density is bounded, yes? The number of edges over the number of vertices, yes, is bounded by half times the maximum degree, which is bounded by half 
times delta power d plus 1. Yes? The second handshaking class. Which means that the grad of my class at depth d, so the largest possible density among such depth d minors, is bounded by half times delta power d plus 1, which is a function of d only, and always finite. Yes? Good. So we are already happy classes with bounded maximum degree, yes, have bounded expansion, as you should expect. Second, um, probably I can squeeze it here. Lemma two. Uh, I claim that if C is say kt minor or maybe h minor three, for some fixed h, then C has bounded expansion. Yeah. So every class where all the members of this class exclude some fixed graph as a minor, yes? Yes? Every such class I claim that it can bound the class. In particular, this applies to planar graphs, yes? Because they say exclude K5. Yeah? And the proof is really simple, given that we already know some, uh, some facts. So we know that the edge density, yeah? In each of my graphs, for my class is bounded by 2 to the t. Yeah, this was proved last uh, last week, and actually you could put here a better bound. Yeah, t square root of t. Yeah. Um, okay, so we know already the edge density. Yes. However, if I take any depth d minor, whatever d is, yes, it will also be h minor three. Uh, here t. Um, t is equal to the number of vertices of h. Because if you exclude h of a minor, you exclude in particular kt of a minor. Yes? And for kt minor, three graphs, we had this bound. Yes? Yeah, so this holds for every member of my class, because every member is h minor three, but also every minor at whatever depth will be also h minor 3, right? Because a minor of a minor is a minor. Huh? So this means that this holds not only for, uh, for just graphs from my class, but also for their one minors. Uh, okay. Mm, for all. Of graphs from C for two minors and so on and so on. All of those graphs, yes, will be H minor three, and in particular their edge density will be like that. Yes? So this means that among the one minors, the two minors, the three minors, the D minors, the edge density will be always bounded by two to the T, where T is the number of vertices of H. Yeah? Note that this doesn't depend on D. Yeah? It's just that the graphs are constant. Right? Good. So we already have our two motivating examples. Graphs of bounded maximum degree and graphs that exclude something as a minor. Okay, so... Um, So now there is a uh, question, okay, we have the final bounded expansion in our depth. So we have seen that our nice examples, yes, uh, they already have bounded expansion. Of course, if a class has bounded expansion, then it is nowhere depth. Yes? Because if, let me even write it as an observation, that if C has bounded expansion, then this implies that C is lower than. Yeah? 
because if I exclude, say, graph of edge density 10 as depth 5 minors, then in particular I exclude cliques of size 100, or 20 actually, as depth 5 minors. Yeah? Because having an upper bound on the edge density yes, of depth d minors gives you an upper bound on the size of cliques, because cliques are depth. Yes? So, what about the converse implication? Could it be that actually lower denseness and bound expansion are the same concept? The answer is that no, and we will prove this during the tutorial. Fact is that there are classes, lower dense classes, of unbounded, unbounded uh, degenerate even. Yeah, because, and therefore they, can, they can't have bounded expansion because boundedness of degeneracy in the whole class, boundedness of degeneracy means that there is a constant upper bound on the degeneracy of every member of the class. Yes? Uh, Boundedness of the degeneracy is the same as boundedness of grad zero. Yes, because grad zero, yes, at depth zero is just the density is just half a, half of the mud, and mud is this factor two apart in some direction uh, with the with the degeneracy. Yeah. So these facts we will prove during the tutorials. It's not that hard, but it's a little bit technical, so I I wanted to postpone it. And it's a nice exercise. Um, so, before we continue, let me draw then how all of these concepts uh, look like if I try to, to show them on the chart. So, on this border will be all graphs. So, here I've got the class of planar graphs. Yes, they are simple, they are sparse. Here, I've got classes with bounded maximum degree. So say delta uh, bounded maximum degree. Yes, there are graphs that are planar and have bounded maximum degree, so there's an intersection here. Yes, a more general concept than planar graphs are classes that are H minor free. Yes, because planar graphs are, are KT minor. Uh, during the last lecture, and we will uh, come to come back to this in a moment, you also have had this uh, idea of uh, excluding something as a topological minor. Yes, where topological minor was this different uh, embedding notion where I was embedding a graph into another graph, yes, so that every vertex is mapped to a vertex and every edge is mapped to a path so that this path needs to be disjoint. Yeah, you remember this one? There was one. We will come, to back, come back to this in a moment. And this is a notion that is more general than H minor freeness. And actually it, it also encompasses classes with bounded maximum degree. Yes, because if I have, um, say, maximum degree at most three, then I will not have K5 as a topological minor because from any vertex, I will not be able to, to, to lead uh, more than three paths going out of it. Yes? So these are H topological minor three. Yes? So then it turns out, and we will actually not really prove it, but, but sort of uh, state it in a moment, that bounded expansion, so the, the new notion, is like here. So classes of bounded expansion are above all of this. Every H topological minor free class has bounded expansion. Yes? Then above this, there are classes that are lower dense. Yes? And beyond this, there are classes that we are not that much interested in this course, but generally they are interesting as well. There are classes that are somewhere dense. Yeah? 
where somewhere dense means not nowhere dense. Yes? So when you think about how the degeneracy or bounded mud fits into this picture, uh, well, every class of bounded expansion have bounded degeneracy, but as I stated in this fact, not all nowhere dense classes have bounded degeneracy. So bounded degeneracy fits something like, like there, and this fact uh, witnesses that here is some plus. Yes? So essentially, this is the, the view of the world in the far city business. Yeah? And what we will be doing now for the rest of this for the rest of the semester, we will be looking at these two notions and trying to understand their different characterizations and different tools that you can uh, how you can work with them. Good. Mm -hmm. Ah. Okay, so we, I have already started to, to, to try to, to, to give you this intuition that uh, we will be mostly working not with single graphs, but actually with classes of graphs, yes? So let's try to develop a little bit more of this kind of language. So, I will say that, um, how to, uh, Okay, maybe I will start with, uh, with, 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 from a different direction with a lemma. So we already said that a minor of a minor is a minor. Yes, a minor order is transitive because, uh, for instance, you can think of it that a minor order can be defined by this uh, vertex deletions, edge deletions, and edge contractions, and of course, this sequence of operations can be concatenated. Yes? So it's reasonable to expect, therefore, that a shallow minor of a shallow minor is also a shallow minor with the right, uh, with the right uh, suitable um, parameter uh, dependence. So the lemma that I want to now prove is the following, that if, say, a graph J is an A, depth A minor of a graph H, and H is a depth B minor of a graph G, then this implies that J is a depth something minor of G, and the something is 2AB plus A plus B. Yes? So if I have a shallow minor of something, and then I have a shallow minor of this thing, yes? Again, yes, then I can sort of combine the, 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 the minor models. So the proof, it's not very hard, but you need to stare at it for a moment. So suppose that here I've got my graph J. Maybe it looks like this. Maybe here is a graph. Here is the vertex, it has some neighbors, there is the rest of the graph, I will not draw it. Then I've got graph H, in which I have a minor model of J. Yes? So for instance, this vertex, uh, say, is yellow. It corresponds to a branch set that maybe looks like that. Yeah, maybe there are some connections to other branches of this model, these edges. Yes? Yeah, the, meaning here the, there is another vertex the, and another branch corresponding to the vertex and so on. And then you've got graph G, in which this graph in turn embeds as a depth B minor. So then each of these vertices is being mapped to like a connected subgraph of radius b. Yeah, there might be some edge here, edge here, two edges there, and so on and so on. Yes? So I've got like branches of uh, j vertices in h and branches of h vertices in g. Yes? So now let me look. So now I want to define a minor model of j in G. And I just do it by combining the two embeddings, yes? This, this yellow vertex will be mapped to the union of branch sets over all the vertices in this branch set. Is it clear how I define it? So what I mean precisely by this, this vertex is mapped to a connected subgraph of, of J, of G, consisting of these branch sets in this yellow blob, connected by these edges. 
yes, that were uh, witnessed by uh, that are witnesses for this for this address here. Yeah. So now recall that this this thing has radius a. So there is a vertex in here that is here. Uh, so that every other is a, is a distance at most a, while each of them here has radius at most b. Yes? So now I claim that, that this whole yellow blob in, in G has radius precisely this at most. Yeah? So let me a little bit zoom in. So this branch that here has a middle vertex, yes? And each of those branchlets has also a middle vertex. Yes? And here is this middle blob which corresponds to the middle vertex here. Yeah? So if here is this middle blob and the middle vertex of the middle blob, yes? and here is a path of length at most a consisting of further blocks, yes? then how far I need to go from this middle vertex of the middle blob to any vertex on this path? Yes? Well, I can always travel by a path of length at most b inside here to the connection point, then travel through the connection point, go to the center, go here, so this is a path of length at most 2b, again here at most 2b, there is a single edge here, 2b, here one edge, and then here maybe to the center and somewhere else. Yes? So in total, how much I need to travel to get to any vertex of my graph? Well, uh, I travel through A blocks, and in each I spend distance 2B, so I've got 2AB, plus in the initial block I've got B, yes, just to get to the connection point, and moreover I've got those edges between the blocks, and there are A of them. Magic. This number appeared. Yes? So essentially just the union of these blocks will have radius to a b plus a plus b. Yes? Okay, so we already see that a minor of a, a shallow minor of a shallow minor is a shallow minor. So let's make some more abstract way of thinking uh, about classes of graphs. So if I have got a class of graph C, And I've got some number d, that parameter d, then I can define this is called the d reduct of c. Yes? This is nothing else than just all depth d minors of, um, of graphs from c. Yes? So I take one class of graphs and I output another class of graphs. Yes? This is an operator on graph classes. Yeah? So for instance, in this language I could express the definition of bound expansion as follows, or maybe nowhere than, so this will be even, even better. Uh, so C is nowhere than if and only if For every depth d, the d product is not all graphs. I miss at least one graph as a depth d minor. Is this clear? On one hand, if c is lower dense, yes, then at every constant depth, I do not see a fixed click as a depth d minor, yes? So in particular, I do not see all the graphs, yes? On the other hand, if at every constant depth I do not see all the graphs, then in particular, I do not see some click, because if I have seen all the clicks, then I would see all the graphs, because if I see a click as a depth d minor, I see also every subgraph, yes? 
This is just a sucker of closure. Yeah? So this is a different way of, of thinking about this nowhere does. Yeah? Okay, so now this lemma. Corollary implies that if I take a graph class C and I take all its say B shallow minors, and then I take all their A shallow minors, depth A minors, yes, then each of such minors is actually a depth 2AB plus A plus B minor of the original class. Right? Because this operator means take all depth B minors, then I take all depth A minors or of depth B minors, yes? And this lemma tells that then I get a depth this thing minor. Yeah? So in particular, this very easily gives me the following corollary. If C has bounded expansion, then for every depth D, the depth D redact of C also has bounded expansion. Yeah? So if I take if I take any class of graph and I take depth one minors of it, then also I get a class of bounded expansion. Why so? If I look at um, grad D, uh, maybe, maybe I'll use a different letter here. Maybe I'll use letter B here. If I want to bound the grad at depth D of my class, of that B minors, yes? Then this is bounded by grad uh, 2 BD plus B plus D of the original class. Because every depth D minor of a depth B minor, yes, is a depth this minor of an original graph from my class. Yes? So now to prove that all these numbers are bounded, finite, yes, for every d this is finite, I need to prove that this for every d is finite. But this was the definition of the boundary expansion of my class C. Yes? Meaning it's a little bit of a fancy language here, but nothing really. Uh, fancy is going on. I'm just saying that if I look at the density of depth D minors of the B minors, yes, then it's just the densities from the original class with the parameters shifted accordingly. Yeah. Good. And the same holds also corollary that uh, C is nowhere dense implies that every depth B minor, that the class, that the depth B redact is no more dense. Yeah, same proof. Good. So we already see that the notions of, of, of bound expansion and of no more denseness are stable under this uh, taking redact. And now we are converging to topological minors. So know that uh, for the last, for the past 50 minutes, I was telling you the story about the, the definitions of bound expansion and nowhere denseness. And I started with the concept that embedding a graph into another graph topologically is defined by, uh, by the notion of a minor, right? But we had two embedding notions uh, last week, namely that of a minor and that of a topological minor. So just to recall, so H 
is a topological minor of a graph G if H has, again, a topological minor model in G. And what does it mean? I've got my graph H, and I embed it into, into G by mapping vertices to vertices and edges to this joint path. Right? Um, so this is a different notion of an embedding, and we could try to build the whole theory based on topological minors instead of, instead of minors. So for instance, I could say that H is a depth D topological minor of G if uh, there is a model, a model where paths are of length. Well, it, it would be tempting to say are of length D, yes, if I'm looking at depth D something, yes. Actually, usually we take here number 2D plus 1 for the following reason that if I have a path of length 2D plus 1, yes, then I can split it into a prefix of length D and a suffix of length D, yes, and a single edge in between, which means that taking this number 2D plus 1 here sort of corresponds to this, uh, to this idea that if H is a topological minor at depth D of G, then this entails that H is also just a depth D minor of G. Why so? Well, if I have a minor model like that, yes, and these paths are of length 2D plus 1, yes, then for every vertex here, I can create a branch set that consists of like a prefix of length that was D here, yes? And this thingy will have radius at most D. And then we want these paths to be exactly to the 2D plus 1? Well, if they are shorter, I just make a shorter leg of this, of this octopus. Okay, so at most 2D plus 1. Mm -hmm. Yes, at most. Uh, of length R, yes. Sorry. Yeah. So now we have a, bound, a notion of a sort of a um, local embedding as a topological minor, like bounded depth embedding. Uh, so we could uh, like just define all the notions in the same way. So let's let's make the definition. So at top grad. It's usually denoted like this. And the D of a class is just maximum edge density, maybe of a single graph G. It's maximum over all depth D topological minors of graph G, yes, of the edge density. Uh, this is just the same definition as before, but now we range over topological minors instead of minors. Yes? And the same for top omega. Yes? So these are the two notions. I can define graphs of a whole class of graphs in the same manner as a supremum. And the same for omega. Yeah, so this is the supremum over all graphs. And I can define that C is topologically lower dense if this top omega at every depth is finite. And is a topologically bounded expansion if 
if the graphs are always bounded. Yes? It's just applying the same principle. Yes? But with a different embedding notion. Yeah? So now, what is a little bit surprising is that in, in the standard uh, setting where I do not have bound on the, on the depth of things, uh, topological minors and minors are quite different, right? Because in a subcubic graph or in a graph that of, of maximum degree three, you can find arbitrary complex graphs as minors, but you will not find even K5 as a topological minor, yeah? But it turns out that these two notions of topological bond expansion, topological lower dense, they're exactly the same as the standard lower dense and standard bond expansion. So phi theorem, say one, is that a class phi is lower dense if and only if C is topological in order. And the second theorem, C has bounded expansion. If and only if C has topologically no bound expansion. So in other words, whether you start your theory with the notion of topological minors or standard minors, it doesn't make a difference. You arrive at the same notion. Yes? Which already hints that uh, something is going on. At least in my opinion. Good. So we will prove this because it is simpler and uh, we will spend the rest of the lecture on proving this. We will not prove this And uh, we decided that this is not within the curriculum of the course because this proof is, is, is simply more technical. I will state the main fact that we that you need to prove there, but uh, but we will not not give it in full details. But in the lecture notes that you can find on the web uh, that we updated last night, uh, you have you also have a proof of this theorem. So if you are interested, it's I think around five six, six pages of a proof. Yeah. So this is considerably simpler. You will see where are the main tricks, yes? And you need to work a lot more with those tricks to get this. OK, so proof of theorem one. So actually, the lemma that I will prove is the following. So I will first state the lemma, and uh, then we will prove it. So, For every D, so fix D, fix some depth parameter. And let T be, uh, let T be some number, yes? And let me take S equal to, this is a function of T and D, let me, D is fixed, so let me, Think of this as a function of, of t only. This will be, I think, 2 tau plus t power 2d plus 1. Whatever, some number depending on t. Think of it as super huge number depending on t. But the proof will actually give me this, this bound. Then I have the following implication. If ks is a depth d minor of some graph G, then this implies that KT I can also find as a topological. So how to read this? If I have a graph with a super huge <coughs> click minor at depth D, then within this super huge depth D click minor, I can find a still large topological minor at depth D. Uh, sorry, not depth D. I will actually have a different a difference of depth, 3D plus. And you have S of D, the first part of this. Yeah, KS of D. Yeah. So, in other words, if I can find at depth D a large, a super large uh, 
click minor, then within this click minor I can weave a topological minor, which is more difficult, of course. Yes? Okay, how this lemma implies theorem 1. Yes? Okay, so what I want to prove, I want to prove the, the okay, so in one direction, one direction should be obvious, yes? If I am nowhere dense, I think, then I am topologically nowhere dense, yes? Because at every depth I exclude some click as a minor, and if I exclude some click as a minor, I exclude is also at the same depth as a topological minor, yes? Because if I had unbounded size topological minor clicks, yes? then uh, actually if I'm topological minor, I'm also a minor uh, in a standard way. Yes? So the implication from left to right <coughs> is trivial. It's just the exclusion of, 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 of minors at any depth it imply the same exclusion of topological minors. Yes? So the question is about the other direction. Yes? So for the other direction, I need to prove that if I want to do it through the contrapositive, yes, by contradiction, I want to prove that if C at some level contains all uh, arbitrary large clicks as minors, as depth D minors, then it also contains, maybe at some different depth, all clicks as topological minors. And this is exactly what this lemma says. Yes? So this lemma implies that if at the depth D I contain, I have all clicks, yes, then at the depth 3D plus 1, I will contain all clicks as topological ones. Yes, because if I will wish to construct a KT as a that 3D plus 1 minor of a graph from G, from C, I will take the same graph, I will, I will take a graph uh, from C that contains KS as a depth D minor, and within it I will construct uh, KT as a topological minor. Yes? Good, so now we are left with lemma. With the lemma. <laughs> so what's the intuition? I start with a huge click minor at that D. So all these branch sets, they are pairwise adjacent and each of them has bounded radius. And within this super complicated structure, I want to find a large topological click minor. Click topological minor. They're not primitive. Good. Uh, so let's zoom in and look at one of those branches. Yes? So. Here is one of those branch sets. And uh, well, it has radius d. So I can find a vertex here so that all the other vertices are at distance at most d from it. Yeah, that's the definition of radius. Yeah, so again, I can draw a BFS spanning tree of this graph within this branch set. And I know that this branch set is connected because this is a click minor, so every two branches are connected. Yes. So this means that from this whole uh, branch set, they stick out how many? Well, 
at least s minus one, uh, well, s minus one connections to other, uh, sorry, s minus one connections to other branches. Right? So this whole thing, this whole structure, the BFS tree within the branchlet plus this edges that connect this branchlet with other branchlet, this is again the same trick. This is a tree of depth at most d plus one. Right? And moreover, it has the number of leaves, well, this is uh, S minus one, yes? The number of different branches that I'm connected to, which is, let me now think what, what I wrote there, one plus T power two times D plus one. Um, yes, which is larger than T power two D plus one. I added this one, plus one just to have a strict inequality. Good. So I've got a bounded depth tree with a lot of leaves. Right? So now this implies that in this tree there is a node, there is a vertex with um, more than T square children. Yes? If I take, I claim that in this tree, I can find a vertex with very many children. Maybe this guy. Yeah? Because if the number of children of every guy was bounded by T square, yes, by a Three of them d plus one, I could achieve at most uh, t, pa t square power d plus one leaves, and I know that I have more. Right? So I see here a vertex with many children. So let me call this guy. Let me um, color him. I think this is orange. Yes. And also let me color in orange, like. For every child of it, let me draw a path. Maybe I can change the color. Maybe he will be blue. <coughs> For every child, I draw an arbitrary path going to some other branch set via this child. Yes, so how many paths I have now defined? Well, more than t squared because the number of children was more than t squared. So just to conclude what I actually obtained in every branch set, so in every branch set, we have a, I will call it a spider with more than t square legs. What does it mean? I have here this branch set. I have here this blue vertex, the one that had many children. And from this vertex, I have disjoint paths connecting it to more than t square other branches. Yes? And this already seems useful because this is sort of a, this is kind of a structure that you are looking for in topological minus, yes? A vertex with many disjoint paths going through it, from it, yes? The problem is that, well, these other branch sets that I am connected to via the spider, they, I do not control which of who are they in this whole click minor, yes? The click minor is much, much larger than t square, yes? But I know that I am, can be connected easily to many, to, to, t, to more than t square other uh, branches via this kind of a spider. Okay.
But these spiders will be enough to prove my lemma. So how do I now construct construct a depth 3D plus 1 minor model of KT. Yeah, so this is our goal. How do I do it? Let me take T branches. Yes, branch number one, branch number two, branch number T. And in each of them I have the spider. that connects some vertex with many other branches. Yes? Um, so in my topological minor model, this will be the images of vertices, these two guys. And now, from this legs of the spider, I want to construct the connections between them. Yes? So for every pair, yes, I want to connect one leg with one leg here via a path that is of bound length. Yeah? So how do I do it? Let me give you the first connection. Okay, I want to connect number one with number two. Yes? So far I used, I drew T of the branches. But each of these guys, both one and two, had actually more than T square legs. Yes? So I can find here some branch set that was not among those. Yes? to which I have a connection via a leg of a spider. Yes? So now I use T plus one branch sets. So I still have a lot of branch sets to find one additional to which I can connect from this guy via a leg of a spider. Yes? Now recall that this, bra this branch set has radius D, yes? No. Same here. Yes? And moreover, they are connected. Because this was a click minor. So what I can do, I can here go via a path of length at most to D, cross via this edge, and then go via a path of length at most 2D within here. Yes? So in this way I create the path of length. Well, uh, this is length D up to this point, yes, plus 1 for this bridge here, plus 2D for going inside this branch set, plus 1 here, plus 2D within this one, plus 1, plus D again inside here. Yeah? Which is, if I'm not mistaken, 6D plus 3. Yes? So this is a path from this center node to this centered node go that has depth has length at most 6d plus 3. And in this way I have drawn two branch sets yes, that I sort of used for this connection. Yeah? Okay, so now how would I connect number one with number three? Again the same principle. So far I used only t plus two branch sets. I've got more than t square here that I am connected to. So again I can find one branch set to which I can connect like that. Yes? Again for free the same. I can find a new one to which I can go via a lack of a spider and again I create such a connection. Yes? And so on and so on. I build the, the connections between pairs of branches one by one. Yeah? So why will I not run out of, uh, out of branches? Well, how many branches will I use in total in this, in this construction? Well, I initially used T, plus for each of the T choose two connections, yes, I use two branches for the connection, yes, which is T plus t times t minus 1, magic t square. Yes? So if I know that each of those guys, each of these spiders always has more than t square legs, this means that 
I will always have the next branch, that, the next leg of a spider to use that is still free. Yes? So all in all, these are my principal nodes of the, of the topological minor model, and these are my connections. They are of length 6d plus 3. I promised you to, to give a depth 3d plus 1 topological minor, but this is precisely the case because I recall that a depth 3d plus 1 topological minor actually has a path of length twice this plus 1, which is exactly this. Yes? Good. Okay, so this was a bit uh, of a tricky proof. The main trick was here. If I, the main trick, and this is a trick that, that sort of appears all the time here. Uh, if I have a bounded depth tree with very many leaves, there must be a vertex with many children. Yeah? This is a very simple trick, but sort of it was crucial here. Good. Um, let me know. Okay. Um, bum, bum, bum. So what about, so this implies that topological lower denseness and lower denseness is the same concept. Uh, let me now state you a lemma. Okay, what we actually proved here is the following thing. Uh, that if I have a graph G and a depth parameter D, then actually I have the following inequality that if I look at that that omega at depth d, yes, then of course it is lower bound by the top omega at depth d. Yes, because if I have a topological minor at depth d, a large click at topological minor, I have a click in particular uh, as a standard depth d minor, yes, because depth d topological minor is a depth d minor. And this is then upper bounded by a function of this. Yes? Of this uh, with the parameter here different. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, this, the proof actually gives you something like this. Meaning, uh, this is nothing fancy, this is a just reformulation of what we proved, yes? What we, uh, sorry, here is, what we proved is that having a huge click as a depth D minor implies having a large depth D click, uh, a large click as a depth D topological minor, which in the contrapositive says that if I exclude uh, some that uh, some click as a depth D topological minor, this gives me an upper bound on the sizes of clicks that I exclude as a depth D standard minor. Yes? This is just the, the contraposite. And if I'm not mistaken with parameters, you end up with this relation. It doesn't matter. What matters is that this is some function of this parameter. Yes? That these two parameters are functionally dependent on each other. Yeah? So boundedness of one implies the boundedness of the other. Yeah? You can think in this way a lot. Um, so one could ask, is it possible to have here D? In the sense, is it possible to have boundedness of, of a functional relation really of top omegas and omegas at depth D? And this is true, meaning you can have here as some function of omega, top omega at depth D. This is simply more, you need to, to take more attention to, to how you construct this, this, this models in order to make shorter graphs. Yes, I was quite sloppy with, with, uh, with, with using longer graphs. Good, so, so this is about lower denseness. What you prove for the bounded expansion, showing that topological minors and minors are, are the same, is the following lemma, that if I look at graphs at depth D,
then the growth of the FD of course is lower bounded by the top growth. Yes, because that's the same principle as depth of D topological minor is a depth D minor. Yes, so this ranges over a smaller number of, of, of minors. And this is then functionally bounded. And now I need to have to look at my notes. So the proof that is in the no that, uh, that you can find in the notes gives you the following bound. It doesn't really matter what this function is. This is bounded by a function of this. Which means that if these numbers are always bounded throughout the whole graph class by some fixed constant, then these, bound, these numbers are bounded as well. Yes? So this in particular implies this theorem that uh, bounded expansion is the same as topological bounded. Because if one of the if one sequence of the parameters is always finite, then the other is as well. Good. So I had one more thing to to show today, but uh, well, time is running out, and uh, I sort of expected this. Um, so these are the two main notions that we will be working with: bounded expansion and lower density. Uh, these kind of things uh, are, these definitions, the initial definitions are based on the sparsity or density uh, of, of, of shallow minors, but during the next lectures we will see very many different characterizations of bounded expansion and, and lower density. So there will be very many different definitions of uh, um, some generalized coloring numbers, some decomposition tools, some colorings. Uh, of your graph, uh, there will be something called uniform quasi-wideness. Uh, essentially, there will be many different combinatorial notions yes, that seemingly look very different from lower density and bound expansion as defined here, but actually define the same notion. Yes? And we will prove a lot of these connections that a class has bound expansion if and only if something else is bounded, something completely, completely seemingly strange. And you have already seen here a sort of a flavor of this by this kind of theorems that bound expansion you can uh, you can equivalently define using topological minors. Yeah. So there is a question of why classes that are nowhere dense are sort of sparse uh, as they do not have say bounded degeneracy, so you do not have a, a bound on the on the on the edge density in 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 lower dense classes. However, they are very close to be sparse. Uh, I will not define now what does it mean to be very close to be sparse in the sense of having a linear bound on the number of edges. Uh, but this, I think, we will be doing next week with uh, Martin, where we will be exploring the edge density in, in graph classes that are lower dense. Good. Are there any questions? So again, let me finish by saying that, uh, that this the previous lecture and this lecture will be soon on YouTube. Um, and that you can find lecture notes with everything that was happening today also on the, web, on the website of the course. And we see each other in half an hour at, on, on the tutorial. Thank you.